we're uh, fixing to listen to just a little bit of this right here to getting back on on a little bit of uh, racism and then we're gonna stop or I'm gonna stop and we're gonna relate way in on racism and the things that has been going on in my particular life that I have just recently received a revelation on and and then we'll move on to the next subject matter which I think is terrorism I haven't listened to much of that other than what I heard earlier this morning pertaining to terrorism of them assassinating one of the leaders of uh, bin Laden that as far as I'm concerned should have been assassinated and taken out within 30 within 30 to 90 days after bin Laden got taken out for some reason uh, we have been played with we have been told with we have uh, it has costed us immensely in monetary as well as physical physical lives it has costed us as far as growth it has costed us in more areas than you can freaking think of now a while ago I was thinking about all this and the thought hit me whenever my grandfather died Kelmer Jackson I was basically eight or nine years old he died in 1989 I might have been eight 19 I mean uh, 1969 excuse me I got my numbers wrong but I remember at Alamo Baptist Church whenever he died there was something that happened that I haven't seen happen since then pertaining to white folks and once more I want you to hear me out before I say what I'm gonna say on that particular day whenever they put Kelmer in the ground of course this was one of my basically one of my first uh, attendance of a funeral that I could actually remember all the details in but I remember whenever they finally got him to Alamo Baptist Church and there was a crowd outside the building because they couldn't put enough people inside the building during the uh, during the eulogy I remember seeing his wife which would be my grandmother faint three or four different times her sister fainted Gladys that was married to Uncle Eden and Pauline and probably about 10 or 12 other ones I had never in my life seen such of a hoopla pertaining to crying and fainting and carrying on in my entire life and of course whenever I was just a young kid like that I'm thinking to myself wow isn't this kind of a, a overkill isn't this kind of a, a bit over the top and of course since I've grown up and since I've got adapted to the world and various customs to various people's lives I have at one time probably whenever I was a teenager more so then than now witnessed funerals of black people that carried on in such of a way they would they would uh, go through all kinds of different motions some of them so they claim some of them get drunk they claim some of them do all kinds of stuff uh, they claim to keep the body out too long uh, pertaining to memorializing the body and they used to carry on like that you used to see people that were screaming and hollering in the church and fainting and and carrying on and and uh, and, uh, and the Holy Spirit moving or you thought it was the Holy Spirit moving because everybody acted the way that they was acting but you know since then all that has dissipated it's went away for the most part I'm not saying that it still doesn't happen in some occasions but for the most part 
people now in America has more pride and dignity than they do towards being open like that. Back then, whenever someone died, especially someone to any importance to the community, I didn't know it at the time, but back then, that was a common thing to see those type of funerals, not only by the black people, but also the white people. Since I've become an adult and been to, I don't know, probably dozens of funerals since then, I have never ever seen a funeral that was on that magnitude and in that level in any other performances by a bunch of white folks down here in Alamo Baptist Church other than whenever they buried my grandpappy. The reason why God spoke to my heart a while ago, the reason why is because of the things that his father done in this community that some looked upon as being a hero while others looked upon as being a zero. Because this was just about the time whenever the transformation period was happening. In the early 1900s, before the 1929 Depression. And he actually had authority, mandated authority, to go around and, and be like a dutiator or whatever, a judge, and go to different places and have hearings. And if they found fit that somebody had done whatever that they had done, white or black, green or yellow, Mexican or whoever, towards them deserving to get the capital punishment, they put it upon them right then and there. Right then and right there. After they had their little court, and after they had their little say, after they talked a little bit, most of the time they had it right then. Sometimes they waited for the next day, depending upon uh, the consequences and who wasn't there and who was going uh, to be there. But they was doing things the old-fashioned way. Right here, within a quarter of a mile from where I live, where my deep, dark roots went into, went into my heritage. I knew that God had led me in 2017 towards putting a signet a signature, uh, signity on the back of my brother as well as myself's headstone of the Confederate Brotherhood, the the the, the brothers of, of Confederacy, on the back of our headstones, but I added a bit more detail to it by putting federal confederacy. No one caught it at first whenever I first put it up there because it was meant to be in a slanderous type formable way. We knew whenever my brother died in 1976 the way that my biological father re responded and reacted his mother was still living here on the property. But we knew that whenever we had to make a family decision and pull in the plug, rather than keep my brother on a ventilator towards him living like a vegetable all his life, I was approximately 14 or 15 years old whenever that happened. I think I was 14, 1976, born 1961, you do the math. I knew that there was something deep and dark, not only about how that I looked up into the heavens in 1983 and I basically said God you have cursed me you have put a curse upon to me because I had tried and tried and tried to live an authentic Christian life and every time I did I was being pulled and straight away from God by temptations or frustrations one or the other Either temptations or frustrations would drive me away from the Lord. In other words, I'd done pretty good for a while, but then I would drift back off. Putting the occurrences that happened 
with my great grandfather in how meaningful at one time the adventures that he was partaking in towards protecting the people in doing his duties what I put on the tombstone of my brother and myself me basically accusing God in 1983 by cursing me and of course about 45 minutes later the very God that I had basically accused of cursing me was the very God that I cried out to help me and he did he had he showed me his mercy even though I was ignorant of the fact of what was going on at that particular time I'm gonna let you listen to part of this and then I'm gonna get back to my story pertaining to the revelation that has just been given to me in regards towards all these affairs that I have really looked at and analyzed and dissected and went over a thousand times in my mind how come I was chosen other than my faith in God going all the way back in Antioch, Illinois whenever I almost died at the age of two weeks then I stuck some keys into an electrical socket then I fell out of a pickup truck and then I had uh, my tonsils were moved and I almost bled to death um, then I fell out of a four-story building and then is whenever the the occurrence happened in 1983 towards the Buick Regal almost killing me I knew that there had to be something to all of this and now thank God my prayers has finally been answered in regards towards all this monotony and aggravation and all this sorrow and all this misery that was inflicted not only upon me but it was inflicted upon to my brothers it was inflicted upon to my brother my brothers and it was inflict and inflicted in ways to my very own biological father that not only had post-traumatic stress disorder coming from World War II but basically turned his back on God and let the devil rule him after his own pappy had died in 1969 because at that time he felt like that he was the king of the of the rule and wasn't nobody going to tell him how to raise his family and wasn't nobody going to tell him what to do and how to do it and he basically showed his rear end around here like you wouldn't believe towards becoming a grizzly type beast but whenever my brother was denied the doctors gaining access to his organs because the doctors couldn't guarantee him down in Memphis Tennessee that my brother's bodily parts would not go into a black person I knew then it was something really really deep but we just couldn't put our fingers on it because we knew that that was the most humiliating thing that an individual could do to another individual that he supposedly loved which was his second son that he had Douglas Keith loved enough that he was still protecting him even all the way to the grave or at least he thought that he was by not being able to get a guarantee from the from the physicians down in Memphis Tennessee after we pulled the plug towards not allowing the doctors to get any of his organs even though my brother was above age and even though my brother signed the certificate on the back of his driver's license towards wanting to be an organ donor and I myself am an organ donor because if I'm at the state that I'm no longer any good to myself maybe I can be some good to somebody else maybe just maybe of course my father didn't see it that way because the only thing that he was thinking of was prejudicism prejudicism hate 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 I didn't realize looking at his eyes whenever he was growing up that that was probably his mentor his grandfather his grandfather would have been James Robert Jackson my biological dad that would have been his hero that would have been his his 
idol to try to impersonate. But yet now, he wasn't looking through the smoke screen towards what he was standing for and the fact that the things that he was standing for was absolutely ungodly and unjust, more so in hanging black people than just white people. I'm not, I'm not going to beat around the bush. There was more people in this particular area because of the teachings of, of the Civil War hero, Nathan Better Forrest, that was part of the Ku Klux Klan that planted a seed in this area that not only my great-grandfather, Jeff Jackson, had an offense to, but apparently Jeff Jackson's son's son, which was James Robert Jackson, also took an offense to. We knew that the decision that he had made was entirely wrong and that he was a sick, sick, sick individual in the way that he thought about the black race towards him being prejudiced. And I guess in certain ways I'm kind of prejudiced too, but it's not about color. My prejudiceism is about the Lord and me serving the Lord and me despising the Antichrist, the Luciferian Lucifer, that has caused so much endless pain and sorrow and misery, not only in my life, but in millions and millions and millions of other people's lives too as well. Because I guarantee you this isn't the only person sitting here that some of these occurrences that has happened has not been handed down traditionally to the point of still having to deal with this problem. I want you to listen to part of this and then I'll get back to what I'm wanting to say in ending this particular subject matter. That's really what's happening right now. You see some fans and some pundits on the right who are saying that uh, she should be so happy that she has America behind her as an athlete who has protested police brutality in this country. And it's it's a very gross, very cynical message to be sending. But Aton is exactly right. The exact people that we see today denigrating these athletes are the people 10 years ago, 20 years ago, who are denigrating the athletes that we now rightfully lionize. And we are, I'm glad that we're having this conversation in the context context of Bill Russell without whitewashing the treatment that he had. But when Henry Aaron died, whenever we celebrate Jackie Robinson, we seem to forget exactly what the contemporaneous treatment of these athletes was, and we're seeing that today. And John, I, I will give my last question to you because, you know, I just want to talk about how unfair it is. I, I look at it, when I discuss it, I talk about how heroic it is that they became activists and they became icons because of the, the tough positions they took in the time that they took them. But no one else has to take those positions, right? So there are other athletes that exist and they just get to focus on their careers. Racism consumes so much of our energy as people, energy that we could be spending loving our families or our neighborhoods or, or loving our communities or practicing our sports. But these athletes, all heroes for doing it, but also there's a toll that it takes that they have to do it. Talk to us in the last minute about what that means for black athletes in particular. Well, you know, Bill Russell has pretty much, you know, laid the groundwork for athlete activists to follow. I mean, he could have easily been quiet. Um, his life would have probably been a lot easier if he was quiet. Um, but the fact that Bill Russell wanted to take upon his 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 role, um, his platform, his position to be right. able to speak for all black people um, is why he is so special and why we'll celebrate him today. Kavita Davidson and Inton Thomas, thank you both. That is all for us tonight. Rachel Maddow's show starts right now. Good evening, Rachel. Good evening, Charles. Thank you very much. It's good to see you there. Good Appreciate to see it. you too. Uh, thanks for home for joining us this up. Now I'm going to stop again. And I'm going to reveal what God has revealed to me about what the individual talking about unfairness that his life would have probably been a whole lot better off if he'd have kept his mouth shut in regards towards not being an activist. 
Well, you would have thought by the time after 30 plus years has passed that the church world around here in Northwest Tennessee would have picked up on supporting somebody that was a Christian activist. And there's no way that anybody can deny that, even though I've been falsely accused towards being the Antichrist, the false prophet, uh, uh, somebody that worships Satan, a pedophile, a brother murderer, um, having sex with barnyard isonomy. Uh, I could go on and on and on about the false accusations, including the false accusations in 1991 towards me going to threaten or being an assassin towards assassinating George Walter H. Bush's life. But just like the heathens up here in Martin that tried to get me for falsifying files, which basically has uh, terrorist type implications, just like the deal that happened to me up around Kentucky Dam whenever I was trying to warn people about electrical disturbances and obviously they must have wanted me so badly that it didn't matter if they was going to break their own rules or, or their own law books that they was going to make my life miserable. But all this unfair treatment towards not only physical damage that I've went through but also psychological damage that I've went through <clears throat> not just with my father but with the general community in general. I haven't never got the white race to back me. I haven't never got the Christian race to back me. I've never got the black race to back me. And I've never got the red man, the Indian race to back me. So as it stands right now, 30 something years later, I still stand in my corner alone with no one but the minority which is the Lord Jesus Christ and God himself. What God has showed to me today, which was a revelation to me, is that curses follow gene pools. And you could actually be punished in this generation today for the things that your ancestors done 75, 100 years ago. It talks about this in the Bible, about the characteristics that followed the gene pool pertaining to curses, that it wasn't necessarily anything necessarily that I had done to deserve this, but it was the, it was the thing that others had done that even made my father absolutely crazy to the extent that he was a vicious animal that everybody around here started calling Grizzly Adams because of his grizzly type ways. So what had happened to me <clears throat> because of this curse that was going to be trying to take me out, destroy me, torment my life, make my life miserable, not only in so many different physical accidents, but also in all the other occurrences, the devil knew that the things that had happened a hundred years ago, I was still part of that bloodline. And the devil also knew because my life had been spared so many times in asking the question, how come you're still alive? How come you're still alive? How come you're still alive, Dennis? So it's puzzled them. It's puzzled them around here to the point that, in a way, it scared them. It scared them because they haven't never really sat down and tried to figure out, well, if the Lord is on his side, 
And no matter what we do to him, he's still going to live. And if the Lord listens to his prayers towards going up into the woods and living like, living like a, a <clears throat> living like a wild man in, in the wild, maybe we should actually start paying attention to this individual towards the things that he's got to say. But as far as I know, they're still ignoring me. Just like they ignored Al Gore. And just like they have ignored other prophets of God, including Noah, that we see the response from, we see the consequences of. And there's been other prophets of God that has come forth with a message that by and large that particular sector or that particular culture did not render or heed to. So God has given me a revelation after 61 years, 61 years and a half basically, towards finally figuring out the, cur the curses that had been placed upon my life was not because of anything necessarily that I had done, but it was due to the fact of what my ancestry had done. And that was one of the things that was driving my father crazy because I couldn't tell you the amount of times that my mother and my two older brothers would sit around and contemplate and discuss who was going to be the trigger man to go into the bedroom and take a double barrel shotgun pretending to justifiable homicide and literally blow his head completely off of his shoulders. Literally. And my mother kept saying, no, we can't do that because they think too much of Bob around here. He's looked upon as being a hero. And you know what? He actually was. To the mean ones and the sorry ones and the no good ones. In other words, old Bob couldn't beat his children hard enough or enough times. Because the the... Elder, the elder society around here, the boomers, they had done characterized all of us as all of us being nothing but either crazy or mean-spirited and do away with all of them. The thing about my grandfather, whenever my grandfather was doing what my grandfather was doing, at that time, for the most part, everybody thought that what he was doing was the proper and correct way. Until World War I happened. They come back from World War I and they started discussing different things that was going on in different parliaments overseas, how they handled their courts and stuff, and that's whenever the change started happening here in America. But it was also whenever uh, the bottom fell out here in America pertaining to the 1929 Depression, and it kind of all kind of mixed in together during my great-grandfather's life to the degree that there towards the last when everybody couldn't pay their taxes and money was tight and he was trying to hold up a bunch of people, be, uh, uh, hold them up because they couldn't pay their bills as far as letting people have stuff on credit. He was so good-hearted that they basically took him down with him and he had to go declare bankruptcy. This was after that he had, him and his wife had adapt, adopted a child. So if he was really that cruel and that mean, would he have cared about an, uh, an orphan? No. If he was really that cruel and that mean, would he really have been uh, supplying the community with supplies? No. If they was really that cruel and mean, would his wife, that was a midwife, that was going around delivering babies before doctors around here ever really come into the area? Would she have been doing that if she was really and truly a cruel, evil person? I don't think so. It just so happens he got caught up in the culture change and he was, you know, kind of flat-footed in what had occurred, of course, age had creeped up on him to the point that now he couldn't do the things that he used to could do towards 
going from town to town or community to community and having these hearings. So he basically gave up on that. He maintained the store for a while. And then uh, Leon, which would have been uh, Kelmer, Kelmer's brother, my grandfather's brother, he took over the store for a while before they wound up shutting it down and bulldozing it down to the ground after my uncle built a nice home right over beside of it. Real nice home. Probably one of the nice brick homes at the time that was in this area. But of course he had problems too because he was an alcoholic. He was fighting the same evil demonic spirits towards that curse. My father was fighting the same demonic spirits pertaining to the curse. And then it fell upon my family pertaining to my brother becoming an alcoholic. And then my younger brother got entangled with drugs that diminished his life to some degree. But now I can look at the big picture after studying this for so long and looking at it and realizing the occurrences that happened was unforeseen circumstances that basically I didn't have control over Bobby Jackson himself didn't have control over, but various pillars of the community at that time should have had control over. But because they were so mean and because they were so sorry, they actually glorified my father in doing what my father was doing, or they just wasn't brave enough to confront him about his problems. And they just let Bob's boys go down the drain. Which actually speaks volumes about the elderly people that was living in this, t in this area at that time that was allowing for children to be abused. And maybe it was because they was abused. Maybe it was because they was abusers. And they was beating their kids' ass the way that my father was beating, beating our asses. I don't know. You know, I never thought that I would say this openly. And publicly I've done already made mention of, about the beatings and stuff and getting slapped around because I couldn't read a word getting not not plumb in behind a chair because uh, I couldn't spell a word get get your ass beat because you forgot to turn out a light get your ass beat because you didn't collect the pop bottles that day get your ass beat because you didn't take out the garbage get your ass beat just because you was in the wrong place at the wrong time we basically become that man's whipping post because the devil had entered into him and he was too stupid or blind, one or the other, to open his eyes to see what he was doing to his family. But what about all the other people? The Stoneses, the Whites, the Robinsons, the Mixons. What about the Cobles, the Hazelwoods, the Robertses. What about all them other people, the Willises, that lived just right around us, that knowing what was going on, but allowed it to go on? What will be their excuse one day when they stand in front of God and God asks them, why you didn't do what you should have done. I think it was because all of them around here was basically possessed. They was cruel. Uh, the cruelness had already hit this area. Like I said, Nathan Bedrick Force had planted a seed, a evil demonic seed pertaining to the KKK, him basically being part of that group in which they claimed that he denounced it there towards the last, but you know, Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I'm not the judge of that. If he did, I'm glad that he did. Because what went on during that time was a bloody, bloody, evil, demonic, cruel society. And of course, after World War I, society wanted to start cleaning up its act after the Civil War. And then after... Uh, you know, some more stuff went on here in America pertaining to the Spanish Revolution War and 
1918 war and Revolutionary War and and uh, World War One. You know, they they wanted to clean their act up a little bit. But I can now put the pieces together pertaining to my grandfather's funeral being so over the top. I can now put the dots together in the reason why I was led of putting a Confederate marking on the back of my brother and my headstone because of all this hoopla that had happened in my life. And I still stand just as firm today as I did whenever I was a teenager, whenever my brother died, whenever we was discussing stuff with my mother in behind the four walls where my cruel, insensitive father couldn't hear us, that what that he was doing and what that he had done in the Memphis hospital pertaining to my second oldest brother was as wrong as it would have been if he would have hung a black man himself. And who's to say maybe that was what was his primary motivation. I mean, whenever you go to war, I mean, I'm pretty sure he probably took out some Germans, just like some Germans wound up taking out some of our people. That was still in hit that was still embedded in him. The seed that his grandfather, which would have been my great grandfather, the hatred of the blacks, wanting to kill, wanting to wanting to bring misery and harm and hurt to people, wanting to destroy. And the spirit of, of destruction was so was so cruel and so inevident in his own life that he destroyed his own life. He destroyed his own family. He destroyed his oldest son of driving him off and being an alcoholic. He destroyed his relationship with his wife to the point that she just was irked to death over him. I mean, I couldn't tell you the amount of times that we would pull the sheets back on their bed whenever they wasn't there. And you would see my mother's side of the bed that was all clean, looked like it should. But you look at his side, it looked like a piece of dirt had been wallowing around or somebody that had been working on an automobile that didn't clean themselves up whenever they went to bed that had been wallowing around on his side. In other words, there was a split right down the middle. My mother's side was clean. His side was totally filthy. Now, you can't tell me that an individual that lives that way is not a sick individual. I'm glad that God has spared me and spared my life so that I can make a video in explaining my story and the things that has went on right here in Northwest Tennessee in Weekly and Obion County. Now let's get on to the next subject matter at hand. Joining us this hour, um, after the 9-11 attacks, it took about 10 years for the United States government to get Osama bin Laden. They got him in May 2011. Now as of tonight, we know it took another 11 years after that to get bin Laden's brain to get the man who was bin Laden's number two in Al-Qaeda at the time of 9-11, the man who took over as Al-Qaeda's leader after bin Laden was killed by U.S. Navy SEALs. The string of attacks and murders attributed to Ayman al-Zawahiri is stomach churning. He was the ideological mastermind behind the turn of Al-Qaeda and groups like that toward indiscriminate mass murder of civilians anywhere, including Muslims, all in the name of Islamic piety. And how he got there, we now, now looking back at it, it seems like a straight shot, but if you sort of dropped in at him at any time in his biography, you wouldn't have known he was going there. He was trained as a doctor. He was a trained surgeon. He was from a respected family in Egypt, born and raised in Cairo. 
By the time he was 15 years old, he was a committed radical who wanted to try to impose Islamic theocracy by force. He formed his first terrorist cell with the aim of overthrowing the government of Egypt when he was all of 15 years old. In the name of the Sharia law, the very thing that the Saudi Arabians have supported and backed up all of their lives and their ancestors lives and etc when islamic militants did assassinate egypt's president anwar sadat at a military parade in 1981 ayman al-zawahiri was one of hundreds of islamist radicals who was tried and imprisoned for that crime he was tortured for years in egyptian prisons while he was there he became an informant supplying information on his comrades to the egyptian security services now what we're what she's talking about here is the characteristics of the Persian Empire. Now we have looked at some of my history and some of our history in regards towards the discrimination and the black race and the white race and what went on and how it went on. But now let's look at their side of the view over there pertaining to their hate mongering and their ideology that is stemmed from the original Persian Empire. This is the very thing that it talks about not only in Revelations but also in Daniel pertaining to the rising of this entity that even God himself does not Tippy toe around, but he lets the world know that even he hates those that confess to be Jews and are not, and those with this descent. Those with this descent. You know, evil is evil, and it don't matter if it's over here or if it's on the other side of the pond or if it's over in Russia, or if it's the way that these kings, uh, they call themselves something else, magistrates or, or uh, uh, whatever, pertaining to like how they dominate people's lives. But it's evil trying to form a gate above the good people above the righteous people and if you'll study the Bible going all the way back 4,000 years ago that was the very thing that God was very very ill about towards the Pharaohs wanting to dominate the children of Israel over there and keeping them under captivity and it was Moses that was chosen of God to let my people go that he kept telling Pharaoh let my people go let my people go God hates this type of hatred and I think now that it has festered the way that it has festered that even God himself realizes that he should have went ahead and taken out this evil demonic being the Antichrist, Lucifer himself, going all the way back to the beginning of the Garden of Eden because it was Lucifer that contaminated humanity. And it was Lucifer that pushed God into the arena towards bringing punishment into an existence. It was Lucifer that swung the first lick that pushed God into hating this demonic evil being because he was a murderer and a liar from the beginning. I'm going to weigh in on a little bit more of what they're talking about right here pertaining to all this terrorism. And to be quite honest with you, I really don't know yet how to feel about this, this last assassination that they're talking about. But as far as I'm concerned, that guy should have been assassinated within 30 to 90 days 
after his, his leader got killed, Bin Laden. So, you know, certain individuals in America, they want to beat their chest in acting like an ape and bragging about what that they have done, but in reality, it's actually a disgrace. It's a disgrace that they had not already killed him years and years and years ago. Years ago. Within 30 to 90 days after they killed Bin Laden. So in a way, the things that our government is trying to shine its brass about are things actually that they're going to be judged towards people condemning them about. Along with all the other stuff that our American government can cannot perform for its own citizens pertaining to prosperity and safety and pertaining to trillions of dollars in debt and having all these jail cells and, and all these people incarcerated in jails and all these drugs and overdoses and gun violence. I mean, I could go on and on and on. So let's watch a little bit more of what she's got to say because I haven't seen nothing until right this point. I have not seen anything beyond this point of what she's fixing to say or how that she's fixing to say it. So let's both listen to it together. Released from prison in Egypt in 1984, even more radical than when he had gone in. He nurtured the growth of his terrorist group, which we, he had literally founded as a teenager. It was called Al-Jihad or Islamic Jihad. He spent time after his release from prison in Saudi Arabia, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan. He eventually became close with a rich Saudi Arabian guy who in 1988 has founded, had founded his own terrorist organization. The Saudi guy was wealthy enough that he was able to bankroll much of their movement himself. He also had great connections all across the Arab world. He was a great recruiter to their cause. Ayman al-Zawahiri eventually became the Saudi guy's personal doctor which gave them a personal bond behind, beyond even their ideological co-interests. After the two of them supplied and supported the Afghan Mujahideen fighters against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, around 1990, they moved on to Sudan um, and on to Yemen to establish training camps there for international terrorists. At that time, though, Zawahiri was still really focused on trying to overthrow the government in Egypt. That was his lifelong dream. In November 1993, his group, Islamic Jihad, tried to assassinate the Prime Minister of Egypt. They failed in that assassination attempt, but they did wound and kill civilians instead. Two years later, 1995, Egyptian Islamic Jihad blew up the Egyptian embassy in Pakistan, killed at least 15 people, wounded dozens of people. Two years later, in 1997, Zawahiri helped plan the Luxor attack. This was a half dozen gunmen descending on a big Egyptian tourist attraction just before nine in the morning in November 1997. The gunmen, those six gunmen, spent 45 minutes methodically massacring the tourists at that tourist site in Egypt, including kids. People from Egypt, people from Colombia, people from Switzerland and the UK and Japan and Germany, 62 people murdered. So Ahari was the mastermind of that. That was 1997. In 1998, Zawahiri wrote what amounted to a declaration of war against America. He proclaimed that groups like his and his friend Osama bin Laden's group, Al-Qaeda, and all the Islamist terrorist groups, he proclaimed were all united as what he called the International Front Against Crusaders and Jews, not to put too fine a point on it. Zawahiri's declaration in February 1998 proclaimed it their mission to target America. Now you figure my event happened in 88. They hadn't seen no development that Ronald Reagan was talking about pertaining to the seals being open, pertaining to the world was not going to be destroyed by mankind in regards towards a nuclear holocaust. So now evil is starting to stick its evil head out. Part of that Persian Empire movement. Ten years, my event happened in 1988, now ten years later, this is going on in 98. 
to target the United States of America and specifically to kill American people anywhere in the world. That was February 1998 that he wrote that declaration of war. Later that same year, in August 1998, they blew up the U.S. embassies in Tanzania and Kenya. More than 4,000 people injured, more than 200 people killed. Then in October 2000, they hit the USS Cole, a guided missile destroyer, while it was being refueled in Yemen. 17 U.S. sailors killed, 37 injured. The year after that, in June, June 2001, Al-Qaeda, Bin Laden's group, formally absorbed Zawahiri's group, Islamic Jihad. He and Osama bin Laden from that point forward were no longer just fellow travelers and compatriots. Now, as of June 2001, Al-Qaeda was it. Zawahiri was bin Laden's second in command. And also, informally, his brain, his strategic thinker, his ideological guide, his doctor, <laughs> the chief operating officer of Al-Qaeda. Two days before the 9-11 attacks, in an operation masterminded by Zawahiri. Uh, I, mean, I want to back up uh, of the events in 91 of attacking the Twin Towers at that time in New York City, that that occurred just about within a few weeks, right before the timeline of what went on down in Waco, Texas, Mount Karma, Texas, with David Koresh. It took another couple weeks of that explosion in New York being cast into the media towards taking limelight, but it took about two weeks before the ordeal ever come around towards getting on the limelight in what was going on down in Texas. There's a pattern here. And you're also seeing where evil is escalating, not only over there, but now over here. Which takes us now to what she's talking about with 9-11. Shah Massoud was assassinated. He was the leader of the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan. He was the strongest leader in that country opposed to the Taliban. Zawahiri wiped him out on September 9th, 2001, doing a huge favor to the Taliban indebting the Taliban to himself, essentially. And then two days later, of course, they rained down hell on the United States of America on September 11th, 2001. But you got to keep in mind that the event that happened, 9-11, September the 11th, was probably pre-planned out five, seven, maybe ten years before that. Whenever they had declared war on the American people in 1998. Well, it grows deeper than that. There was a group of people that wanted to put their God, their religion, their belief on the, on the global stage pertaining to the Sharia law that this is where all this has stemmed from and is still stemming from pertaining to Saudi Arabia. In Pennsylvania, in New York City, at the Pentagon. This was the first wanted poster put out for Ayman al-Zawahiri after 9-11. This is from October 2001, just weeks after the attack. You see the reward for information leading to his capture at that point was $5 million that would soon quintuple to a $25 million reward, the largest reward offered for anyone on Earth. After a U.S. Navy SEAL mission in 2011 took out Osama bin Laden, Zawahiri became the head of Al-Qaeda. And at that point, Zawahiri became literally the most wanted terrorist on the FBI's list of most wanted terrorists. And you can see, if you look at the two different wanted posters, you can see that over 20 years plus, while the reward did go up, you know, they didn't change the photo of him. They didn't change much about what they knew about him. In the meantime, in the meantime, while all this is going on, while they're dangling and playing and doing what they're doing, they focus in on bin Laden and they get him 
but they're also focusing in on people like me towards trying to erupt, disrupt, slow down, hinder, or completely stop the mission that God had given me going all the way back to 1983 whenever I felt like that I had been cursed in which I had and the curse did not come from God but the curse come from the evil demonic spirit world pertaining to that in which what had erupted in my great grandfather's life going back to the days of hanging right after slavery had been abolished during the Civil War. But yet, no, they still had the Ku Klux Klan, they had the Knight Riders from over here at Real Foot Lake. There was a lot of mean, cruel things that was going on in America during that time. Just like what's going on today. I can't get over how come America is wanting to put so much emphasis upon this particular assassination because over in Afghanistan there's death and destruction 24-7. I know that they want to say that America is the worst country in the world pertaining to all the gun violence and we are pertaining to a civilized society, a civilized global society, we're the worst. But whenever you get to looking at the heathenistic societies that's still over there in the Middle East and different places, they top it, baby. The Middle East tops it pertaining to people's heads being cut off and people getting butchered and, and people getting blowed up and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the only thing that I can figure is maybe somebody, you know, kind of wanted to do a favor and turn this guy in. Maybe they felt like that he wanted to die some sort of a, a military death by getting blowed up, you know, at the age of 70. All the scrapes that he'd been into, I'm pretty sure that he was probably pretty down and out pertaining to arthritis and bursitis and every other thing. But for this to now arise this way, I tend to wonder, because you keep in mind, they tried to make me out to be a terrorist. My own people right here in Wickley County and up in Kentucky and over in Oklahoma tried to make me out to be a terrorist. So I look at this and I see all these dots and I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is a diversion. Now, is it a diversion that's coming from the American government? Or is it just a diversion coming from the satanic Luciferian world? Well, it could be both. Because at this point in time, a great deal of Americans have lost faith in their own government. They do not trust their own government. And to prove that, now, uh, the event that happened pertaining to January the 6th with the, with the, uh, uh, with the capitals, Capitol building of the insurrection, the attempted coup, would not have ever occurred on the level that it occurred if everything would have been hunky-dory in the United States. So obviously it's not just me that's saying these things about trustworthiness towards me not believing almost a single word that comes out of the American media pertaining to our American government. Because it's pretty obvious that they have failed their duties in protecting us and taking care of us. They can't even they can't even take care of us whenever it comes to analyzing a storm properly and telling us that it's fixing a dump anywhere from 10 to 12 to maybe 17 or 18 inches of rain in the next in the next few minutes to warn everybody that if they're down in a low place maybe they can get out. They've just now come around for the past 25 or 30 years, which I'm glad that they have pertaining to Doppler in being able to pre-warn people within a 10 to 15 minutes before a tornado comes out of the sky they can see the rotation up above the cloud level 
But because of global warming and because of the atmosphere getting hot, now all the moisture is going up higher into the atmosphere, and it's building more moisture into the atmosphere. That way, whenever it does come down, it comes down all at once. It comes down in these massive floods that just this week, we have seen a total of about five or six. Uh, uh, Kentucky, St. Louis, West St. Louis, Ozarks, Flagstaff, Phoenix, Arizona. Not just gully washers, but we're talking about flooding to the point of property being damaged and people's lives either being at risk or dying. I think right now the death count up in Kentucky has already come past 30 something people. And they claim that there's going to be many more. advise people to find him but tonight there is an update tonight they've updated the poster at long last this was just changed this evening as we were prepping to get on the air put a big red deceased across the bottom of it now what we know is this i'm in also the guy was 70 years old who's to say that he didn't have a death wish and he himself turned himself in to whoever killed him that way he wouldn't die a slow, irking, miserable, painful death because they don't have hospice. They don't have the type of medical treatment over there like they do over here. And whenever people die over there, they, they still go through the the groaning and the, and the aching and, and all the torture and the torment that goes along with dying. So maybe that was the answer. Or maybe it's a diversion. Or maybe it's just a bunch of hogwash. But the bottom line is this. Our government has deceived us. Our government has failed us. Beginning in the Ronald Reagan era, where things should have been more openly exposed rather than trying to defeat the very person that had been anointed towards trying to bring peace and prosperity in regards towards orchestrating a revival that is pretty apparent that the people around here or in Union City or the surrounding areas still does not still does not desire still does not desire so as I'm watching these weather events escalate and intensify I'm thinking to myself yep they rejected other prophets of God whenever God spoke to them and gave them a message. And they have rejected my message too as well. So now we see the same thing happening again that happened then. It's happening now. Isn't it amazing what goes around comes around? Well, see, that's what Jesus said. Jesus said that this generation shall not pass till all things be fulfilled that was the time a frame of his generation then there was another generation then there was another generation then there was another generation there's been thousands of generations that has passed and each generation has went through its own sorrows and its own problems again and again and again why is this because we're not learning just as it emphasizes very directly in the first three chapters of revelations for i this is god speaking to the churches and if he was speaking to them then he's speaking to them now for i have not found your works perfect yet go back and do thy first works over again or else or else i will throw thee off in to great tribulation. Those ain't my words, friends. Those are words coming out of the King James Version Bible. And if you don't believe me, pick up the Bible and read them for yourself. So Wahari was back in Afghanistan, which itself is a story. He was in a well-off neighborhood in the capital city of Kabul. The New York Times and the Washington Post are reporting that the house where he was killed was owned by a senior member of the Taliban government known for having links to Al-Qaeda. 
Uh, the man's name is Hakani, which is a familiar name when it comes to... You know, it's funny that we can't even get our own story straight over here. You know, just like the killings that went on over there in Texas of them children. You know, it started out first the governor was... was, was uh, was basically putting the, the police officers on a pedestal towards what kind of job that they had done, making them look like that they was heroes. And then after we got to investigating that situation and we figured out, well, the story wasn't so much about heroes, but zeros. About how that men stood around and allowed for a maniac to kill little bitty children while they heard shots and screams and hollers for 77 minutes. So it's got to the point that I don't know who to believe or what to believe. Uh, they have lost all credibility and not just my eyes but in a great deal of people's eyes. And it's like how come they know so much about this story towards whose house it was, what time it was, all the above. Well this is their story. Is their story believable? We thought that the story in Texas was believable. Come to find out, there was a lot of irregularities in that story. It's very dangerous whenever a government cannot be trusted by its own citizens. And that's where we are, and that's the reason why the eruption happened in regards towards the Capitol January 6th uprising. That's where we are. Mappings of terrorist attacks and mass murder in Afghanistan over the past 20 plus years. And I still say, who's to say, that because of all this talk just within the past week about Donald Trump and him either sponsoring or being sponsored with Saudi Arabia and now the chit chat has come out on open open media mainstream media pertaining to uh, our government knowing that Saudi Arabia did finance 9-11 maybe this is a discursion to get us not no longer thinking about that, but thinking about this. There's something going on here that is not direct and it is not right pertaining to deception and lies and not taking care of the American people. Just like Secret Service, knowing that hoopla was so big January the 6th and then delete all of their emails. If you don't smell something in the woodpile in all these dots that I that she's been talking about and I've been talking about, if you don't smell something in the woodpile pertaining to all this terrorist stuff, as far as I'm concerned, your reasoning is not within reason. Well, the U.S. military no longer has anyone in Afghanistan. The U.S. government was apparently able to obtain intelligence on Zawahiri's whereabouts dating back for several months. They were specifically able to get information on the pattern of life at the house where they knew he was staying, dating all the way back to April. And the reason that's important, the reason they were watching the pattern of life at that house was both to confirm that he was there, but also to try to find the right way and the right window to get him without getting anyone else to get him and get him alone. President Biden was briefed in detail on the prospects for a drone strike hitting that house. The intelligence community reportedly built a physical model of the house that they wanted to hit. They used that physical model to show the president their intentions and to brief the president on how the mission might unfold. President Biden said in remarks to the nation tonight that he gave the order a week ago that they could strike when the right time and the right circumstances arose. Those right, ty right circumstances and that right time apparently arose Saturday night, Saturday night just before 10 p.m. Eastern, which was just after 6 a.m. Sunday morning in Kabul. It was reportedly two Hellfire missiles fired from a CIA-operated drone. The president said tonight there were no other casualties other than Ayman al-Zawahiri himself. 
The president also said this. The United States continues to demonstrate our resolve and our capacity to defend the American people against those who seek to do us harm. You know, we, we, uh, we, we make it clear again tonight that no matter how long it takes, no matter where you hide, if you are a threat to our people, the United States will find you and take you out. I tend to wonder if our own government officials hasn't become a harm to their own people because they can't take care of their people. They can't even prevent they can't even prevent hackers. They can't even prevent in telling people 15 to 20 minutes ahead of time that there's going to be a major storm that's going to drop 10, 12, 15 inches of rain. They can't even protect us pertaining to all the drugs coming over here, all the illegals coming over here. They can't protect us pertaining to all the uh, physical crime going on, pertaining to our jails being all full, and the corruption in our courts. What the hell is going on with our chief and commander in thinking that we're just a bunch of idiots that aren't going to be able to see through this. And I'm still saying that it's a strong possibility, friends, that it could very well be some sort of a diversion because of the chit-chat that it was going on with the 911 commission commissioners, the, the, the 911 uh, victims of Donald Trump basically smearing it in their nose by getting so close over there, knowing that the Saudis was in behind 911, and knowing that the Saudis was with Donald Trump in sponsoring that that uh, golf game, uh, yeah, so, something something has come up. Something has changed. There's too much going on here. It has been 20 years and 10 months since Al-Qaeda killed 3,000 Americans on U.S. soil in the 9-11 attacks. It took 20 years and 10 months to get the two guys who ran Al-Qaeda during that attack. And it should have taken no longer than 30 to 90 days after Bin Laden himself was assassinated. This guy should have been assassinated. So in a way, what the government is trying to promote in bragging rights, it's actually shameful rights because they should have got the guy long ago. You know what I'm saying? I mean, come on. Astonishingly, the leader of the Republican Party, the party's last president and their likely next president. Now let's see how she's going to flip this because I, don't, I haven't heard none of this, but let's listen and see how she's fixing to flip it. Because she's going to flip it the way she was told to flip it. Nominee said just this weekend that, quote, nobody's gotten to the bottom of 9-11. Literally said that this weekend. Okay. Nobody's gotten to the bottom of 9-11. What was that all about? Okay. Very thing well, I was talking about. It took 20 years and 10 months, but actually somebody definitively has gotten to the bottom of 9-11. Ayman al Zawahiri killed yesterday at age 71 with the blood of thousands and thousands of innocent people on his hands. Joining us now live from the White House is John Kirby. Until a few months ago, he was press secretary for the Department of Defense. Now he. Well, if people think, if that's what the government's trying to promote, that now they've finally gotten to the bottom of 9 11, they're still being misdirected and deceived by our American government. Because I guarantee you there's a whole lot more to it other than that, than that freaking guy that got freaking assassinated at the age of 71. I thought he was 70. He's spokesman for President Biden's National Security Council. He's also a retired rear admiral in the United States Navy. Uh, admiral Kirby, I really appreciate you making time to be with us this, this evening. It's a historic night. Absolutely, Rachel. It's good to be with you. It's a good day for the country. Well, let me ask you, um, in my summary there, in terms of what we know, about what happened, uh, both about Mr. Zwahri's background, but also about how you got him. Um, is there anything that I've left out or that I got wrong? Is there anything else that you can tell us about how this mission unfolded? 
No, I think you did a pretty good job uh, rolling out the history here of who this man was, what he was responsible for, um, and um, and how he met his his end. Um, I can tell you, there was an awful lot of work done uh, by the counterterrorism and the intelligence community to get us to this point. Uh, it was painstaking, meticulous, thoughtful work. Uh, as you rightly uh, pointed out in your opening, uh, Rachel, the president was kept informed throughout finally made the decision uh, in late uh, July, the 25th of July specifically, um, and then of course we executed it. And, and uh, even though he had given the order on the 25th, the conditions needed to be right, and there were a lot of conditions there. It was weather needed to be factored in. Of course, uh, Mr. Uh, Zawahiri needed to be where we thought he would be based on his pattern of life. And then the president was very clear. Uh, that he didn't want us to cause civilian casualties. And so that also factored into making sure everything was just the conditions were right. Uh, and uh, when it was, uh, we took the shot. With something like this, obviously, the, the only antecedent that comes to mind really is uh, that famous image of President Obama and Secretary of State Clinton and others um, in the Situation Room watching the raid unfold yeah. that ultimately killed Osama bin Laden. I just have to ask you, just in terms of historians looking back at this day, these briefings, these planning sessions, the president's decision process, was it gravely interrupted? Was it, um, was it a dis, dis um, was the process interrupted at all by the fact that the president has COVID and he's been in isolation um, on and off during, during the time that this was all being decided? No, not at all, Rachel. No, I mean, he worked uh, right through uh, his, his time with COVID. In fact, he's still isolating now. I think, as you know, he has a rebound case here. Uh, but no, it did not affect his decision-making process at all. Uh, he was able to constantly stay in touch with his national security team throughout. Uh, no, no impact whatsoever. And I happened to be here in, in, uh, in 2011. I, 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 was, I was here at the White House. I was working for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mullen, uh, when the mission to, to get uh, Bin Laden went down. And so for me, this was also personally a, a, a nice bookend to that. Hmm. I have to ask you in terms of what happens next here. It would have it would have been if it would have been done in a reasonable time. I mean, we're supposed to be the strongest, smartest, most sophisticated army in the world. We got CIA agents everywhere in the world. We have spread ourselves out from A to Z towards bragging about how that we're supposed to be experts in excellence pertaining to all this in which, you know, I, I'm so glad that, that they killed him. I, I'm, I'm act, absolutely ecstatic that they got finally got him. Uh, and I'm glad that there wasn't casualties in getting him because that's one of the things that our United States military is got a reputation towards not doing that other countries either don't care about not doing towards blowing up and killing innocent civilians. I can honestly say that our government, our military, has been very, very good in, in, in using tactics a precision laser targeting towards not having to kill a great deal of innocent life. That has been one of the most remarkable things that I have seen coming from any army or any military knowing history all the way through the Bible, etc. towards what has occurred, knowing various wars that's happened, Vietnam War, Korean War, Desert Storm War, Desert Shield, the 20 year Afghanistan War, comparing it with stuff that like poisonous Putin's doing with the Ukrainians, there ain't no comparison. We are the best in that sense towards laser targeting accuracy. But to be bragging, about somebody that has been at large for 20, almost 21 years? Is that what she said? That ain't nothing to brag about in my book. And Donald Trump is absolutely correct. 9-11, we have not yet got down to 9-11 pertaining to who was actually the mastermind 
of 9-11. People can snigger, they can laugh, they can make fun, they can degrade, they can walk away in their shameful, idiotic pity. But whenever it's all said and done with in the hereafter life, I promise to my people, providing that I got any, I, they ain't showed me that I, that I got any pertaining to supporters in support and peace and, and, and utopia. But I promise you that one day, everybody's going to know the who, the what, the when, and the why. And there's going to be a lot of things that's going to be disclosed that the American people are going to be very, very shameful towards in the, in the regard towards how that they was misled, how that they was deceived, and how that their own politicians sold them downstream. Pierre, um, do you believe, does the administration believe that the Taliban knew Zawahiri was in Kabul. Obviously, you know, the justification for invading Afghanistan in 2001 was that the Taliban were providing a safe haven for Zawahiri and for bin Laden and for the Al-Qaeda organization ahead of 9-11. Did they know that he was back in Afghanistan, back in Kabul? We, we know that some senior leaders of the Haqqani network were, were aware. Um, and we know that from the way that they tried to uh, to cover things up over the last uh, 24, 48 hours. That's really about as far as I can go into this. Hmm. Uh, but uh, but we, we have indications that, that some of them were aware. Look, I mean, Al-Qaeda was on the ground in Afghanistan even when the president decided to end that war. And we knew that and we talked about that, that Al-Qaeda was, was already uh, uh, reestablishing a presence there. We also said that we were going to watch that very, very closely and stay vigilant and make sure that we had the capacity from an over-the-horizon perspective to, to, to deal with any threats to the homeland. Mr. Zawahiri's uh, presence in Kabul certainly met that test because he has been actively involved in planning and plotting threats uh, against our homeland uh, going forward. One of the things that the president mentioned tonight in his remarks is that Zawahiri has been recently making videos calling for people to attack Americans and, uh, and to attack That's right. U.S. interests. We've heard from a senior administration official that it's possible that even after his death, Al-Qaeda or their confederates may release further Zawahiri videos. They may release some of that material that they've sort of banked ahead of his, ahead of his death. The U and it's also possible that you may have just kicked up another beehive. I mean, when if you get to looking at all the hypotheticals here, let's don't look at just one or two of them. Let's look at all of them. It's a possibility that you've just got through knocking into another beehive. It's absolutely insane. It's sickly insane towards how that our government has failed its own people. That to pose additional threats, does that raise the threat level for the United States in terms of potential retaliation from terrorists? It very well could. Uh, we don't exactly know how many videos he recorded and whether there's still some in the can, Rachel, but it's entirely possible that they could put that uh, out there as a, as a way to inspire uh, future attacks uh, and future Al-Qaeda Al planners and, and plotters. And so we're going to be watching for that as well. Uh, I can tell you our vigilance is very high uh, and we're not going to be, you know, we won't be caught uh, off guard and in fact they do try to do that. But again, we'll see. We'll, we just don't know if he actually has additional videos he hasn't released. Along those lines, let me also just ask you in terms of being aware, as you said, that at least some elements of the Taliban, uh, the regime in charge in, in Afghanistan, knew that... Like I said, the guy was 71 years old. He got away for 21 years, or right at 21 years, towards being at large. Who's to say that he didn't call somebody up and say, you know what, let's make this look this way. Let's lure the American government into doing something that I don't want to do myself and obviously y'all don't want to do it to me and and we'll go from there towards what happens who's to say that the American government wasn't lured into something and they took the bait every part of this is so flabbergasting 
and so heartbreaking. It literally outrages me to listen to a lot of this. The Wahari was there. Um, their express expressions of sort of anger or or or, or upset that this that this uh, strike happened within their territory. Do you anticipate that the Taliban themselves could try to mount some sort of retaliation, or if they do, are they capable of causing harm to U.S. interests? Uh, we're going to be watching real, real close, uh, Rachel. I, we don't have any indications right now that the, that, that particular uh, threat can manifest itself. Uh, but look, the president was very clear tonight, as he has been, quite frankly, since since uh, the, the war in Afghanistan ended, that we're going to we're going to stay vigilant. We have the capability and capacity to conduct over the horizon counterterrorism strikes. We proved that this weekend, um, and so uh, I go back to what the president said, which is there's no greater responsibility that he feels than for the safety of American of the American people and our national security interests around the world. And I think, again, we proved that uh, over the last couple of days. Uh, we'll, we'll stay able and capable of proving that going forward if, if, uh, if in fact, we have to do that. Admiral John Kirby. I sure hope so. Uh, spokesman for President Biden's National Security Council. Sir, thank you for your time tonight. I feel like congratulations is not exactly the right word here, but I think, I think thank you probably is. So thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Joining us now from London is Richard Eng. <coughs> and the reason why that she probably don't feel like congratulations is in order here. <coughs> it's because it took too long. <coughs> Man. Is Richard Engel, NBC News chief foreign correspondent, who has covered Al Qaeda and uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri for decades, a man who knows more than your average bear about the Egyptian Islamic radicalism in Cairo that shaped Zawahiri. Um, Richard, my friend, thank you for interrupting your vacation tonight. Thank you for being up at O Dark Thirty for us once again uh, on this historic night. It is a historic night, and of course, I think it's a very important night. And yes, I've been covering Ahmed al-Zawahiri since the mid-1990s. I was a reporter in Egypt uh, when uh, terrorist attacks were becoming an increasing problem in the country. You mentioned the Luxor attack. Uh, when a, a group of Islamists went on a rampage and just started massacring tourists uh, in front of the pharaonic monuments there. And then uh, then he decided to keep going and he joined up with uh, Osama bin Laden, founded Al-Qaeda, first as this international front uh, against Jews and Crusaders. and. Now we have come to uh, to where we are today, uh, and I think there are really two ways of looking at it. What, what you just heard from from Admiral Kirby was a kind of a positive spin on it. It showed what, other than a little bit of drugs, poppy or whatever they call it, over there. What industry have they been profiting off of for the past? Going, you got to go all the way back to the time frame, whenever it ha whenever it occurred, and what was going on in Af Afghanistan pertaining to their marketing skills. What could have they have been doing that they would have been financed, financially sound enough to be able to finance this type of a movement? I don't think they did. That's the reason why I think the money was laundered it come into them from another area and they was just taking their orders everybody thinks that bin laden was the chief and commander everybody thinks that bin laden was the mastermind bin laden wasn't the mastermind bin laden didn't have those type of skills bin laden had a lot of money but so did his family. So did the kingdom. So where did all that money come from, huh? Yeah. Yeah, because it didn't come from the Afghanistan because they don't have a market, or they didn't have back then, a big enough market to support anything like this. The United States is still capable that if the Taliban goes back on its deal, and clearly it was going back on its deal, or at least elements of the Taliban were going back on the deal and welcomed in al-Qaeda, that they wouldn't be able to get 
away with it because America has eyes on and has the ability to carry out lethal strikes from the sky. Let's hope so, so you could say, oh, the policy is working because if there's a Al Qaeda infiltration or presence, the U.S. can take care of it. But there's another way of looking at it. It shows how confident and how arrogant, one might say, the Taliban have become. That even after swearing that they would never host al-Qaeda leaders again, that they would never uh, go back uh, and repeat the past, that they don't just have an al-Qaeda leader, they have the al-Qaeda leader. He's hosted right in the, in the center of Kabul. He's there for months. And it, it shows that they believe they can, they can do whatever they want. I was in, uh, in Afghanistan after U.S. troops uh, withdrew from the country, after the Taliban drove them out, and I met Taliban leaders, and they believed that what happened was a miracle, that they were yeah. given this victory because of uh, a, a gift from God, that they were untouchable. You could look in their eyes. If you, if you ever noticed, a lot of American reporters were going around with the Taliban. There was no hostility. They were not just proud of what they had done and wanted to show it off. They believed that this was a miracle right. and that, that it was their duty a God to show thing. the world a God God's thing. actions on earth. So when you have that kind of mentality, you, you're not really intimidated by what the U.S. is threatening to do. You say, well, we've gone through hard times in the past and look where our faith brought us. Uh. So they had bin Laden, they had uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri. Look where their Sharia law has brought them in the country near the presidential palace for months the fact that the u.s got him shows that the u.s still has very good intelligence there still was able to get informants who were able to establish a pattern of life inside the building but over time will those informants continue to be as good and will they be able to find other targets who aren't necessarily as famous as 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 as, as i Walker, who the united states has been tracking for decades well, it, or maybe you just took, maybe they just took the bait, buddy. There's also another way of looking at it. Maybe they took the bait. Maybe they was wanting this to occur. Maybe you just triggered something else towards their group, our groups, that now has got the green light towards doing something else. We're dealing with adversaries, we're dealing with evil, we're dealing with people that are wicked and are powerful. They're just not goat herders. Lay that out. I mean, this is obviously a very rude interruption to any reverie that the Taliban might have been under in terms of them believing that they were being, you know, that they were they were divinely inspired and that they were being divinely protected for their actions. This is going to interrupt that in some ways. And I asked Admiral Kirby a moment ago if they're anticipating retaliation from the Taliban. And if so, is the Taliban capable of inflicting pain on the United States in a way that will actually hurt? He didn't, he didn't answer. He basically said, well, watch for that. But what do you think their reaction will be to this strike now that it's happened? And again, I, I think probably surprised them given how, how willing they were to hide him relatively uh, in, in a relatively easy to find place. So, first of all, there are big divisions in the Taliban, which is one thing that the Taliban weren't expecting. Uh, you heard Admiral Kirby talk about the Haqqani network. That is a big group of the Taliban that is particularly close to al-Qaeda, and not all of the, the, the other factions in the Taliban support them, but they are still a very, very powerful uh, faction, perhaps the most powerful in terms of, of security. So a very large segment of the Taliban will be shamed that this happened. They hosted this important figure uh, who they, with, the, with whom they have a relationship going back many, many years, and he was killed in their territory. You know, the Taliban released a statement uh, after a drone strike this weekend. Uh, it, it seems to be the, the same drone strike. Uh, they didn't say who the, the, who the target was at the time, and they called it a violation of their sovereignty against international norms, and they said that it could close the doors for future cooperation and opportunities. So, in a way, the, the response was 
a rejection, but but fairly measured when you look at other statements from the Taliban. So they were angry. They're saying it's going to close the door for other cooperation, it's, and it's a problem. But they weren't threatening to burn down the White House or, or, or carry out an attack like this. But, but there will certainly be elements uh, within the. T and they're not going to, because they're smarter than that. They don't advertise what they're going to do before they do it like we do. Within the Taliban and within Al-Qaeda, uh, who, will, who will want to, to seek revenge. Uh, that said, he was not a particularly charismatic leader. He never really filled the shoes of Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden was the face. He was the brand name of Al-Qaeda. Uh, Ayman al-Zawahri was the legacy player. He was the intellectual. He was the, intellect, uh, he was the scholar, if you will, uh, establishing the bedrock of, of the ideology. But he never commanded a lot of personal loyalty within the group. The next leader uh, might be able to be more effective in that way. Richard Engel, NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent uh, in London, technically on vacation, but that's always fungible, uh, given your beat. <laughs> Richard, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here, my friend. My pleasure. Again, President Biden tonight confirming from the White House the news that the leader of al-Qaeda, Ayman al-Zawahri, age 71, who took over leadership of the group in 2011 after U.S. Navy SEALs killed Osama bin Laden, Ayman al-Zawahri has been killed by a U.S. drone strike in Kabul in Afghanistan. I'm telling you, the main players have yet to stick their ugly faces out in regards towards all this. It'll happen. It'll be brushed out. Guarantee you. Uh, that news being confirmed by the president tonight and remarks from the White House um, 20 years and 10 months after the attacks of 9-11 killed 3,000 Americans on U.S. soil. We have very much more ahead tonight in this busy news night. Stay with us. 20 years and 9 months is how long it took to get one man. One man. Once more, I didn't know how she was going to spin it or who's paying her to spin it. She seemed to spin it all right. But it's not what you're looking at, but how that you're looking at it towards the at least negligence. You, we can at least say it was negligence and how that our government handled this situation of waiting so long in getting this guy. She wants to put him in a category towards him basically just being just the average old Joe. Who's to say that that wasn't re uh, Bin Laden's rear gunman all, the, all along? But it was not the mastermind. Neither nor was Bin Laden. That's what I keep saying. You need to dig a little deeper. And you'll find out who plotted, as Donald J. Trump said, getting down to the bottom of who actually done that. A great deal of dirt is going to be brought up, and whenever it does, there's going to be shameful politicians in America that have let us down, that has not only sold us downstream, but as far as I'm concerned, they have created an act of treachery in siding up with the enemy. And to think that the people up here in Weekly County in Martin, Tennessee, pertaining to the Martin Police Force, wanted to stab me as me being some sort of a could be, would be homegrown terrorist. Same in Kentucky, same up there in Oklahoma, and I got a little bit of it in Atlanta, Georgia. They just didn't pursue it quite as far as Oklahoma, Kentucky, and Tennessee has pursued it. Very, very, very suspicious in all of this. Good luck to all of us as we enter program all the time. God bless America. God bless our troops. God bless our endeavors towards where we go from here. And good luck to all of us.
Shalom.